This is Limited Supply, the place for refreshingly real takes on what D2C is really like. We're your hosts, Nick and Moyes. Let's start talking about money. All right, Moyes, did you know that the Messi, Messi's a soccer player, his store tripled sales in a month after they launched their tap card app. They basically, they saw a higher conversion rate, obviously, because it's within the app, but sending people to their app and then getting people to browse and shop, especially for a category like apparel, it crushed for them. They got push notifications, they got instant page loading, which I don't know if you've run like ads on TikTok yet, their instant page works really well for conversion. And in the mobile app, it does just as well. You get one click checkout and typically we see higher AOV from that as well. I think if you're a limited supply listener, you should definitely be on Tapcart. You should go to tapcart.com slash limited. You'll get two months free, try it out, send it to us. We'll rate it and we'll give you a review. Okay, Nick, episode nine, season three, Uh, you know, there's not that many episodes left, uh, unfortunately. We just hit the 75% mark. Uh, yeah, um, this is, uh, you know, we're recording on March 13th, bunch of stuff just happened over the weekend. Um, you know, South by Southwest just happened. Uh, uh, you know, e-commerce fuel just happened. And maybe most importantly, or most shockingly, uh, Silicon Valley Bank imploded over the, uh, on Friday and certainly over the weekend. Yeah. Um, we're obviously going to talk about the SVB stuff. Um, you know, curious to get your take on, um, you know, whether you know any companies affected or don't know any companies affected, uh, I'd love to chat about that because I think it'll be really exciting. Before we do that, though, um, I know you were at uh, e-commerce fuel and you were at South by Southwest. You're, you know, making the tours along with Joe. B- You're like Joe Biden. You need your own aircraft. <laughs> yeah, hey, if anybody this. wants to offer us a limited <laughs> supply jet, I won't say no. Uh, um Tell me, you know, did you have a good time? What happened? Uh, you know, give me the give me the hot take on uh, South by Southwest and the hot take on e-commerce fuel. Yeah, uh, the hot take on e-commerce fuel was that like the boring things work. Everybody there, you know, doesn't run like a trendy modern retail headlining direct to consumer brand. Everybody runs something very simple. Uh, there, it's a, it's like usually one category or one product. And they know it inside out. They know the entire industry. They know everybody in that one industry. And, um, you know, they just do the basics really well. Um, And so I think like sticking to the basics was a good lesson there. A lot of times we overthink a lot of things from, you know, what does the site design look like or the animations or, you know, this or that. And, you know, you really just got to focus on good landing pages, good copy, you know, making sure you have the trusted buy stickers there the the mastercard and the paypal verification check um and you just got to sell a good product what was the most surprising thing you learned there the most surprising thing was probably um <clears throat> it was surprising to me only because i didn't realize this was this was something that was like uh not frowned upon but um i heard Sean McGinnis talk the guy who uh he he's now on a new company, but he was the CEO of Kuru Footwear. And um, he was telling me that, actually, I just thought of a better one. His navigation menu on the site has like probably, you know, 150 options to choose. Every, Every single one of them is just a reason to buy their shoe. And so, you know, a lot of times like you know, you, you might sit in a room and think, all right, there's seven reasons people buy, but I'm going to choose this one and go all in and test it. This guy's like, oh, dude, there's 75 reasons people buy this shoe. We put them all on a nav bar because as soon as somebody sees what they're looking for, they're going to click. Okay. So I'm on it. Is this for Kuru Footwear? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. And so like I see, it says shop by foot pain, shop by activity, shop by career, more categories. That's what you mean by that, right? He's yeah. Every all human, these, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah every all possible option. Yeah. yeah. this is like everything red antler would hate (laughs) Uh, okay uh i've got a lot of thoughts about that but before that what was the funniest moment at the uh at um e-commerce fuel the (laughs) the funniest moment was learning about somebody who makes tens of millions of dollars selling sprinkler heads and then when i when i spoke i was i was just saying how cool it is to come here and meet people like that and yeah. uh, and so I said, you know, it's cool to come meet people making millions of dollars selling sprinkler heads on Shopify. And uh, 
later he just dropped his business card with an, a second card uh like right in front of me and just kept walking and it was like his business card but it was also like a card for his podcast this guy has a sprinkler podcast where he talks about sprinklers wow i know i haven't I listened to how- it yet i'm going to though yeah that's crazy and he's got a card for his podcast he's got huh? a card that's for it must be really doing well like, yeah yeah um you so know, that was cool yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, going back to Kuru Footwear for a second. Um, I always thought that there should have been a shoe, and maybe there sort of is, but no one that I've heard of, like um, like Figs. You know how Fig is, Figs is like for medical professionals. Yeah. Why is there not a sneaker for nurses or like a like you know a sneaker? Because you think it'd be like good for standing all day, good for walking. It, you yeah. know, you should be able to wash it off because it has to be like you know you're going to spill blood or human you know uh, liquids on that thing. Like you know someone's going to pee on it or. Um, do something bad like you know you're a nurse there's going to be mm-hmm. human fluids uh floating around and uh, i'm surprised there has i'm surprised figs hasn't launched their own uh footwear although i think they've teamed up with like new balance a couple times or one of these brands to do something but never like really done it well yeah. um, i'm surprised there's not a um you know a nurse's footwear like there is nurse's scrubs um that you know looks better uh and is also like made specifically for nurses um i think that's a real opportunity you are not the only person who thought of that. In fact, there is a guy named Rob Gales who was – this guy, first of all, he looks like a GQ model. Second, he is a so performance marketing <laughs> – he's a performance marketing genius. And uh, he launched this company called Gales. And the site is WearGales, G-A-L-E-S dot com. And um, you know, this is another one where – I haven't this guy been is like to it, but I don't like him because shoe. he's a GQ model. It's an award-winning yeah. shoe. It is an award-winning shoe. It's like been top rated. Um, wow. And uh, he's absolutely crushed it because nobody is in this market, um, yeah. like you're saying. And so he's basically a single single player owning this category. And how have you heard of this? Um, I've known Rob for a few years. Um, okay. And at first when he said he was starting this, I was like, whoa, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know anything about that, but then he, he just like launched it. He found a manufacturer, made the product, tested it, did like 90 iterations of the shoe. Then he launched it and, um, just completely crushed it. Okay. It's doing well. Like I guess on similar web, he has like 54,000 uniques a month. Yeah. Okay. Well, I still think there's room for somebody to do this. Uh, totally. But I like that. I uh, uh, love it. Uh, yeah, I just don't like him because he's a GQ model. So I don't want to <laughs> <be an> asshole. <laughs> no, I've never met him. I've not, I don't know. Anything about him. I'm just joking around. Um, okay, awesome. Uh, how did you like South by Southwest? Uh, it was cool. I basically just went for a day. I went. Uh, I woke up on Sunday morning, flew in. Um, I stayed at – do you know Neil Parikh? Casper yeah. co-founder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he just got a house in Austin, so I stayed in his spare bedroom. And um so I was there and hung out with a few friends. And I feel like the cool thing about Austin when there's like events going on is you go somewhere like Soho House and you just meet nine other people there that you haven't seen For in sure. a couple of years that are just great people. Um so yeah, just bopped around, went to the Shopify Creator Mart, went to the TikTok house that they had set up. And how nothing, was the uh, how was the Shopify Creator Mart? It was cool. I think it was uh, I think it was a, a little underwhelming. I would say, just from the standpoint of the hype it had. Although I think the main attraction was, it seems like the main attraction was more like, um, you know, one was like promoting creator brands. One was like, let's make a cool studio setup for podcast recordings and. Because uh, that was their main thing is they did a podcast recording Friday yeah, and with Sunday. Harley and Tim. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. And um, but you know it was like I mean on the other hand you know maybe the goal was keep it quick moving because there was just thousands of people there so they don't want people you know slowing down. But what was cool was it was all Crater Brand so they had Chamberlain Coffee, uh, just like you could get coffee from Chamberlain Coffee. There was this other brand Juvie that we also launched. And they had a Juvie slushy machine, which is basically like an energy drink. Um, but uh, what else? You you got like a barcode when you got in. You would scan the boxes. And then um, if it says winner, then you go collect a little prize bag. Um, okay, did you win anything? I did. Uh, I think it was like what a can win? of Juvie. And truthfully, I, I just put the bag in Dennis's car and didn't even see it. 
but I think oh, I it was like a can of juvie and something jet. else. <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, out of curiosity, what is Neil from Casper up to these days? Believe it or not, uh, and I, you know, I probably shouldn't say this. He was like one of the first ten customers at Native. Like, I remember the first ten. You know, I remember them purchase. Like, you know, I was looking at all the orders for the first. Uh, you know, the first time people ordered from us. Yeah, he was definitely one of the first ten that ordered. Um, and you know, he wasn't. He didn't. He didn't say, "Hey, this looks a lot like Casper's website." What the fuck are you doing? He didn't say any of that. So I really <laughs> yeah. respect that. Uh, what's he up to these days? Um, he is working on something new. Uh, I probably shouldn't share it yet just because he's okay, no like problem. in stealth mode. But um, he's working on something new that I think is pretty interesting. And um, yeah, he's just a cool okay, dude. He's yeah. like a, a cool Indian Heard dude. great things about him. Yeah, yeah, I've never met him, but I've heard fantastic things about him. Yeah. Um, um, okay, you know, there's a, a, there's a couple other... Th- I guess, what was the funniest thing that happened to you at South by Southwest? Um, let's see. Probably not a ton. Honestly, the coolest part was uh, I went to this dinner last night. So, uh, do you know Night Media? They're like the 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 talent company, the venture arm, and the media company of, that's like the Mr. Beast management yes. team. Yes. Um. So I went to a dinner that they hosted last night and met a ton of people who listen to Limited Supply and uh, love listening to it. And um, so that was probably the coolest part. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I want to talk about a couple other things before we get to SVB as well, because I feel like that's been dominating the news. And while I do want to spend some time on it, I hate, like, you know, I'm not sure if everyone wants to hear 45 minutes of SVB. Yeah. Um, one is Birchbox. Birchbox seems to have completely failed. Did you see that? Have you noticed that or not? I actually heard about that. Um, but what, what happened? It's unclear. Like in 2021, they were purchased by somebody um, for like $45 million um, that did like subscription boxes. But like, you know, maybe a, maybe a couple months ago, they just posted this thing on Instagram basically saying, we know we're disappointing you guys. We're going to have answers for everyone in a couple weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, they've never had answers for anyone. They posted that. Um, shoot. How long ago? Let's see. November 7th, 2022. So five months ago, it says, To our members, we know you're frustrated. Birchbox is facing a host of unprecedented setbacks that are affecting all of you, our cherished members. Within a couple of weeks, we will be able to share details about the future and what you can expect. Anyway, a bunch of people are getting screwed because basically, if you bought a year subscription box, you're not going to get another box ever again because this business is over. That is crazy. There was What was the other company that this just happened to recently? Um, it was another like I. It might have been Touch a Modern. Yeah, I think it was Touch a Modern. Um, Touch a Modern isn't a subscription box, but they, yeah, yeah, they true. sort of also went away that kind way. Kind of marketplacey like, though. Yeah, yeah. And the question is like, what happens to vendors and all that kind of stuff when you go through right. bankruptcy? Which, uh, you know, I guess perhaps is a good segue to finally start talking about SVB, <laughs> um, and what happened. Uh, I guess before we start, do you know any brands that work? Uh, do you know any brands that bank there? Like, um. Yeah, uh, a couple. One was um, Camp, which is like a kids retailer brand. Uh, another one is Omsom. They're the sauce company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, and then Imi was also at Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, were they? Yeah, but they got out uh, on Thursday or Friday. He was quick. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah. Did, you, yeah. did you know? I was actually surprised that most of the people I talked to were not banking with Silicon Valley Bank. Most people were either uh, Mercury, Brex, or Chase. So a Chase, I get, and Mercury, I get. I thought Brex was just a credit card. It's a whole bank. You can do all. Yeah, they recently at Brex. added a, an entire like bank behind it, and um, and they started pushing that heavily, and I think um, it. It yielded a bunch in interest payments back to you, or you know they had some sort of catch to it. Um, but I remember there was some sort of like a financial incentive to do it, and a ton of people moved to Brex. Um, American Express also has like a business banking as well. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess uh, there were a bunch of people. Uh, like I, there was one company that I know of. They were like uh, they texted a couple of people on Thursday, and they're like, "Hey, should we move our money?" And one of the guys was like, no, you're going to be completely fine. And then on Friday, they're like, should we move our money? And I was like, 
I think you should move your money Friday morning, like, you know, early morning. And they're like, okay, great. We initiated the wire and they're like, and wires are over uh, (laughs) as is the bank. And so they didn't get their money. They were worried about what they'd have to do over the weekend. I I mean, I got a bunch, not virtually all, but like probably 20% of the startups I've invested in emailed and either said we have exposure or we don't have exposure. Yeah. Um, And obviously everyone sort of was fine today because the federal government stepped in and said, um, Hey, this is what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess a couple of things. Uh, one is, how much are you aware of what happened? Um, I would say that I I feel like I'm only about thirty percent aware in terms of understanding what happened, why it happened. The way I understood it was they basically the way banks make money is they loan their assets out to basically go make more money for them, and um, with the trajectory, the, the same way that e-commerce companies order over-ordered inventory for 2022, they overextended their capital thinking the deposits were going to continue at the same rate. And then some memo got leaked. This is where it gets a little tricky. Some memo got leaked or some memo was put out and it became a signal for people to immediately start taking their money out. And that's about it other, other than like, you know, it gets resolved. Uh, uh, that's a pretty good summary. I'd say like, you know, for someone who's been traveling for three days straight and is on zero <laughs> sleep, I'd say, yeah, you probably got what 99.9% of people got. Awesome. There's this great article by this guy named Mark Rubenstein. It's called the demise of Silicon Valley bank. I just shared it with you. Awesome. Um, and it is such a fucking good, su- I don't know who Mark Rubenstein is. I've never met this guy. I just Googled this, uh, you know, article. This guy, not only did he sum up the issues really well, or not only did he sum up the issues, he summed it up in a way that's re- really dumb people can understand. Hmm. Um, and so basically, uh, I was reading this, and I thought that was such a good summary. Basically, what happens is when a bank purchases... Uh, so a, a bank's job is, hey, we're, you're going to deposit money at the bank, and we're going to loan that money out and get high, higher interest, right? So Nick, you've given me um, a Moise Ali bank a dollar. Mm-hmm. I have to pay you. I'm going to give you 1% interest. But I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to loan that dollar to John. And John is paying me 5% interest. So I'm paying you 1% and I'm keeping the other 4%. Mm-hmm. And that's how I make money. And you know that's a very good business model because it costs me nothing. It costs me only 1% to you know borrow a dollar from you. And I give it to right. John and I get 5% and I get the difference between those two. Yeah. Uh, now, Silicon Valley Bank was an interesting bank because you know it focused primarily on uh, tech, uh, on like you know startups, and um, it grew the number of deposits it had over the last four years in an insane way. In December 2018, it had 50 billion in deposits. Two years later, December 2020 it has 100 billion in deposits, so it's doubled the business. December 22, 175 billion in deposits. Wow! So basically, they're virtually doubling every two years, while the industry is growing at not even half this pace. Like Silicon Valley Bank is growing, you know, doubling its size, and the rest of the industry is only growing 37 percent. And what I mean. The rest of the industry, I mean, Chase's deposits are going up 37% during this Mm -hmm. time, while Silicon Valley Bank's deposits are going doubling. Um, So one, Silicon Valley Bank is like, hey, the Nick Sharmas of the world used to deposit, you know, know, four years ago, deposited 49 billion. Now we're sitting on 200 billion. That's a massive difference. And the other thing that happened is, you know, at Chase Bank and at uh, Bank of America, I bank at Bank of America and have since I was, you know, probably 15 years old. Um, they have regular people like me and you banking at Bank of America. At Silicon Valley Bank, they have massive startups with a ton mm-hmm. of money. The right. average account, I looked this up. The average, so uh, you know, they have a hundred and seventy. Let's say they had about one hundred and seventy-three billion dollars of deposits. One hundred and fifty-two billion was uninsured, meaning it was above the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar mark. Yeah. Um, and the average account was more than $4 million. The uninsured, wow. the average account that was good was more than $4 million. It's basically startups or like Roku's, like it's tech companies as right. well. It's not just startups. It's like tech companies. It's those guys that have money at Silicon Valley bank and not so many individuals. So one is like, you know, what becomes important is the size of their account. It's a massive account account with a small number of depositors. Like, you know, how many bu- depositors does bank of America have a ton? Because every Joe schmuck like me banks at Bank of America, right. while uh, you know Silicon Valley Bank just has a bunch of rich people or startups. 
So what happened is like, um, you know, Nick, you were, let's say you kept your money at Silicon Valley Bank and uh, you had deposited a dollar and I was paying you a dollar one. Well, at some point you realized, hey, interest rates have gone up a lot and um, I'm getting a dollar one from Moyes. But if I go to the bank of Joe Biden, I can get 5%. I, instead of getting a dollar one at the end of the year, I can get a dollar five. So these, so a bunch of Nick Sharmas of the world in this instance were like, hey, look, I can go get a dollar five instead of a dollar one. Mm-hmm. Silicon Valley Bank, it's been real. Thanks a lot. But I'm going to take some of my money and go deposit, go get higher interest rates. So that was one thing that happened. The other thing that happened was the tech market started getting a lot quieter. So, right. you know, as Silicon Valley Bank was used to getting a lot more deposits as a result of VCs funding other companies and them having accounts as, as VB, those things sort of dried up. And so what happened is that um, you know, for the first time in a long time, the number, the dollar deposit value at SVP declined. Uh, so it's 198 billion at Mar- at the end of March 22, 173 billion at the end of December, and 165 billion at the end of February 2023. Wow. So, uh, and this is all based on this article. Which, so just to be clear, you know, my research is uh, from a an art- couple articles that I read. I didn't. You know, go talk to the CEO of SVB or anything. I imagine he's not doing interviews with schmucks like me. But in any case, their deposits are falling. And what happened is about a year ago, Silicon Valley Bank made a terrible, terrible decision. And they said, okay, Nick, um, or they said, okay, world, well, we've, we have $200 billion in deposits. You know what we should do is we should buy a lot of debt with a long term maturity date. Uh, so basically, we're going to go buy, mo- we're going to spend uh, $80 billion and buy mortgages that'll be due in 2033 or 34. Mm-hmm. And those mortgages pay uh, no no interest, basically no interest, 2% interest. Are you following me so far? Yeah, totally. And so, you know, what happens when like, um, when interest rates go up, the price of a security goes down. So like, let's say you own a dot, let's say you have a dollar security from the US government and it's paying 5% in interest. Well, if you can get 10% in interest, 10% is way better than 5%. So I'm not ready to buy your 5%. Let's say you have this thing that's paying 5%. And I found a thing that's paying 10% by the US government. Well, guess what? Your 5% thing isn't as valuable because I can get 10%. So you got to mark down the price of your thing. Your, your bond from the US government. So that's basically what SVB had to do in this instance. They said they bought $80 billion of securities uh, at a really low interest rate. And as interest rates started going up over the past 12 months, the value of their security dropped materially. And finally, they had to do about a $2 billion write down. And when they did a $2 billion write down, they said, we're going to do a $2 billion write down because the value of our securities has gone down a bunch as a result of interest rates going up. And um, we are going to have, uh, we're going to add $2 billion to our balance sheet. We're going to raise $2 billion. And that $2 billion never came in. And, uh, you know, everyone got scared that they weren't going to be and able how long There was ago, just a run on the bank. How long yeah. ago did they say they were going to raise $2 billion? Was that the memo that came out last Wednesday? Yeah, that was the, yeah, that was the memo that came out last week saying, um, so just to be like, I feel like I've done a poor job of explaining this. Basically, the value of a security, if, if you if you're if you have a, a bank account or if you if you own an instrument and you say that says, hey, Moise is going to pay me five percent on this on this uh, on a dollar every year, so I'm going to pay you a dollar. I'm going to pay you five cents every year, right? So on the dollar, if you loan me a dollar today, I'm going to give you five cents from a year from now. Well, what if to somebody else, to John, I offer him ten cents? I'm going to offer him ten cents for every dollar he loans me. Now, both of you are selling this dollar loan that I have, right? You're like Nick. Nick, you're like, look, I need the dollar back. I'm going to sell this uh, to somebody else. Well, they're going to right. say, well, oh, I can buy John's, and Moise is paying Moise is paying John ten cents. Right. Nick, he's only paying you five cents. Your thing is worthless, right? Because a year from now, I only get five cents from you. I get ten cents from him. So fuck you, Nick. I'm not paying you a dollar for your thing. I'm only paying you ninety five cents. Right. Because that, so that's what happens. So basically, what happened is that they had to write down the value of their bonds because interest rates had gone up so much. And uh, the write down in the value of their bonds caused, um, you know, people to be, caused them to say, hey, we're going to raise money. They re- released this uh, a memo that said, hey, we're going to raise money. Everyone was f- afraid that they wouldn't be able to raise money. And that, the, the fear of them not being able to raise money caused this run on the bank. Got it. Um, so in one day, I think on Thursday or maybe it was Friday, forty-two billion dollars of deposits was lost because everyone was afraid that they were, um, you know, going to be insolvent. They needed to take their money out first. That is crazy. That's almost a third of their. Yeah, probably that is almost a third. That is, and so the, the I guess the questions are a fewfold. One is, um, 
you know, is it right that the government stepped in to do look to say, hey, uh, all of you tech companies with an average of four million dollars in your bank account, we're guaranteeing this. We're going to come in and say, yeah, we've got this. And that's probably the right thing to do because without this type of trust, the whole economy falls apart. Right. Um, the other weird question is, you know, but like Silicon Valley Bank was a bank to a bunch of startup businesses. And aside from taking deposits, the other thing that they did is give out debt. Like they loaned my brother at TinyCo something like $40 million at one point, you know, not a decade ago, maybe close to a decade ago, actually. Now, uh, is that a, you know, now what happens to that debt? Like, yeah, you know, I was, who that's, you so that's pay? what I was thinking about today. Basically, everybody who put a dollar in got their dollar out, but all the people that were that had a loan or a line of credit, line of debt, some sort of uh, you know, basically money from them that was borrowed. I have no idea what happens to that. Does that just like, oh, sweet, we just, it, you know, it's like either maybe it's they just keep it or nothing happens to it. It's not that. unless maybe the government's <laughs> coming after them. I have no idea. How does that, that work? Would be so- if if those guys got like if if Silicon Valley Bank loaned your business twenty million dollars and now they went out of business and you're like well I got to keep this twenty million fuck you SVB that would be the greatest uh, you know I would be like everyone Bank of America is going out of business I uh, you know please go <laughs> <laughs> yes I just bought this house and owe them a bunch of money uh, I owe Bank of America a bunch of money but I think they're going to go out of business everyone get your money out of it uh, no. The, the real question is, yeah, how are they going to like, I don't know how they have to pay it back. Yeah. Uh, I think that's unclear today. And the other thing is that if you, if you got an agreement of debt, like let's say the Silicon Valley bank loaned Sharma brands, $10 million. One of the uh, terms in that agreement was you must, va- you must bank only at SVB. Your money must be kept at an SVB bank. Mm-hmm. So now what do you do? Because SVB is bankrupt. So you right. you know there's no way you can bank only at SVB. They they don't exist anymore. And so I think that's a big question for a lot of companies that nobody's talking about. Which was I bank there, I got my money out. How do I owe? Like who who do I pay back debt to? You know, is there a shitty pro life tip for me not have to so I can avoid <laughs> having to pay back this debt? Is there a way to skeet out of this? Right. And uh, you know, what about the terms of that debt? What about that terms of that agreement? I had said I had to bank at SVB. Well, now you can't hold me to that. SVB doesn't exist as a going concern. Yeah, I have no clue. Did you see? Um, uh, where did you see most people go from SVB, like bank wise? Chase. Chase. Yeah, uh, I did see. That's a good, great question. First, I saw a bunch of scammy, you know, comp- uh, scammy people sort of being like. This is the day we're going to get a bunch of business, you know, like uh, not Brex, but I saw it from a bunch of other scammy direct to consumer businesses. Like people reach out to me on LinkedIn. Hey, do you know anyone who is using SVB? Oh, I feel so bad. If they need an emergency loan, contact me. Oh you know? my God. <laughs> did, people, did that happen to you or not? Um, so as soon as I kind of figured out what, what was going on, and started getting uh, emails from portfolio companies basically saying, I got so many emails basically like, yes, we're safe or no, we're not safe. Yeah. And um, so as soon as that happened, so the at e-commerce fuel, I was hanging out with this guy. Um, <laughs> I was hanging out with this guy, Travis, uh, who's like their growth and partnerships person. And we were just, you know, shooting the shit and he was telling me about their just their treasury account where you can basically just earn 4%. And so then I was like, oh, let me connect you with uh, all my friends who have uh, you know, Mercury. Let's turn that little secret menu option on. And then as soon as this happened, I texted him and he was like, oh, we can easily like help onboard. And so, um, so I was just connecting people to Mercury as quick as I could. Is Mercury paying 4% on deposits that are just sitting there? Yeah, 47 I think. Oh my God. Here's the other crazy thing that I learned. So Silicon Valley Bank's FDIC dollar amount was 250K. Yeah. Mercury's is, their normal one is 1 million. I think Brex is one and a half or two, which is kind of crazy that Silicon Valley Bank's is so low. And then the and then today Mercury came out with a product for 3 for million. 3 million. Which yeah. is crazy. 
For, uh, so a couple things. One is I tweeted about this last night and then I deleted the tweet because I felt like a scummy doing this where I was like, yeah. a new business idea is you create uh, an insurance product and you say, hey, look, you pay either the bank pays a dollar per account or you pay a dollar to basically insure your account to north of $250,000, which I think a lot of people might be like, look, this might be worth it. So I don't have to feel this type of stress over the weekend. The other thing is you almost don't even have to worry about this at this point because the FD, like the federal government stepped in and said, hey, we got but, your back. But I feel like the federal government – because um, in – where was it? In the Great Depression, over a 1,000 banks failed and the government never stepped in. But here I feel like they almost just stepped in because of how much innovation power for the country is sitting behind Silicon Valley banks' deposits. Uh, okay. Um, well, yeah, that is, uh, crazy during the great depression, the FDIC never stepped in. I don't know enough about that time period to understand what was happening. Then here, I think they stepped in, um, for a few reasons. One is, um, uh, they love bailing like one, there is a systemic risk. So let me start by saying there is a systemic risk. If one bank fails, you know, mm -hmm. if Silicon Valley bank, if they let them bail, I'd probably pull out a bunch of money that I have at first Republic today. Um, and what would you do with that? You'd get cash, Chase. Like dollar bills, put it into Chase oh, or in Bank, Bank of America. Bank. Yeah, because okay. Bank of America and Chase, if Bank of America or J.P. Morgan Chase is allowed to fail, that's the end of the United States as we know it. In yeah. overnight, think about how many tens of millions of people bank there. If you can't right. get your money out of J.P. J.P. Morgan Chase bank account or uh, like you know P and G banks at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, right. uh, you know big Fortune five hundred companies do. If you can't get your money out of there. That is, you know, one of the pillars of the American financial system that falls. And so this is like a domino where if the pillar is JP Morgan Chase, this is SVB and like it can push over one can push over the other. Right. But I also think that like um, you know, they're like uh, I, I don't know how much, I don't think we want to talk a ton about politics, but this is a net like there, this is a massive bailout. Uh, and, and it's a bailout that probably should have happened, frankly. I think it's a bailout that should have happened, but like there needs to be, you know, everyone who says there's too much regulation, like all of the people who are like, there's too much regulation in the banking industry. I want, if, if one of them says this again, I want to be like, great, uh, your account is uninsured. And if the, any, if your bank fails, fuck you. <laughs> you lose all your money. You think there's too much regulation? Well, Fuck it. We'll take away did, uh, on your account. How, how did um, – okay, so going back to the inventory analogy, like order over-ordering inventory, how did you know the CFO of Silicon Valley Bank not forecast this? Yeah, it was actually like um, – I'll give you two – I'll tell you two things. First, yeah. um, I think – the inventory issue is a good issue, but or a good analogy, but I think here may be a better one, which is uh, the you know we work. We work basically signed really long term leases. They're like, hey, look, uh, we want we want an office space at the Empire State Building for twenty five years, and we're going to pay you five hundred thousand dollars for the floor, right, or uh, right. ten million dollars floor. I don't know what the prices are. And then they leased out individual office spaces. And the, the, when the pandemic came, you know, look, these are short term office spaces with. A, but they're getting revenue from really short-term sources, which is right. they rented out this tiny office to Moiz Ali, and Moiz Ali pays them five hundred dollars a month, and he can leave at any time because he has a one-month lease. Mm -hmm. They cannot leave Empire State, the Empire State Building, or the five hundred thousand dollar obligation have because they signed a ten-year lease. That's a little bit about what. That's sort of what happened to SVB. They got all the money that they in their deposits from people who had short term deposits they could leave at any at any time and started to because they found cheaper interest rates or cheaper you know housing or office space elsewhere. Right. But they had really long term obligations in that they purchased a security that they had to hold for ten years or fifty and, and like the value of that security went down a lot. So I think of it a lot like WeWork, which is you get revenue from short term sources, but you have to pay out something in law. It's almost the opposite, but like you know, it's the short term versus long term. You you got all of your money from short term sources, but you signed long term obligations and those long term obligations are killing you cuz your short term sources of revenue are disappearing. Right. Imagine they you imagine you have an office space at, at, at the Empire State Building, you rented out the whole floor for, you know, for the last 2 years every single office space has been taken. Then a year ago it was, you know, 90% then 70%, now 60%. Well, guess what? We The Empire State Building is like, you got to pay us. You got the whole floor. Yeah. And you're like, I only have this 60%. Well, go fuck yourself. You know, it's like the mafia. Give me my money. Right. That's your problem. Pay me. Right. 
And so I think of it as like that we work problem. Um, I'm sorry, but what was your question? Your question was, how do they get into this? Like, you know, how, how did the CFO not predict that venture capital investing would slow down, which would then, you know, cause deposits to slow down? Yeah. Okay. So we know retention is the yin to the yang of acquisition. And we know about email, we know about SMS, we know about all these other channels. But one thing I think we don't talk about a lot is push notifications and mobile apps. And this is where Tapcart comes in. If you saw the Shopify editions update that just came out, they talked a ton about their app, Shop, which is doing a ton for merchants. They're seeing higher AOVs, they're seeing higher conversion rates. And we've actually seen the same with our clients who use a Tapcart app. The beauty is you can't even tell it's built by Tapcart, but Tapcart essentially is the CMS. It's the Shopify of the mobile app. They build it in Tapcart, they get it live, and they can start sending traffic either through their email list. On their site, there's a little pop-up that says open the app versus looking at it on the site. And it's been pretty amazing to see how special customers feel in their mobile app. You know, they get push notifications, they get customized notifications based on when they last bought. You know, if I bought native deodorant and I'm, you know, 40 days out, I'll get a push notification that says, hey, you're probably running running out, click here, you know, get a discount or whatever, click here to buy real quick. I think it's something that our limited supply listeners should check out and they can actually get two months free at tapcart.com slash limited. So check it out, build an app, send it to us. We'll review it, DM it to me or Moise, and we'll see you on the other side. Um, let me tell you, like, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, uh, you know, I work with this wealth manager. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm not going to name their name because they're, uh, cause I'm going to say about a bunch of bad things about them right now, <laughs> but, uh, you know, about a year, about 18 months ago, they're like, uh, Moyes, we're, the Fed is going to get us to a soft landing. We're not going to have to raise interest rates that the Federal Reserve isn't going to raise interest rates that much. Uh, you keep all of your money in these uh, corporate bonds that uh, are slowly decreasing in value because interest rates are going up, but it won't be bad. Won't be bad. All of the pain we've already suffered, and this was more than a year ago. They're like, all of the pain you've already suffered, you won't suffer any more pain. And I was like, no. Get all of my money out of corporate bonds because I think the value of those bonds is going to go up because I think interest rates are going to keep rising. Mm -hmm. uh, fuck you. And they're like, no, here are 20 PhDs that we have. We manage, you know, we manage uh, money for billionaires. You're the poorest person that we know and you're the dumbest person that we know and you're wrong. Uh, keep your money in this shit. And I was like, no, uh, you you dumb assholes don't know anything. You would, you don't know any. And so I was like, get my money out of here. And um, so we, I did take my money out, and I start. And then I was like, hey, put it in U.S. Like this, this wealth manager got it completely wrong. I think a lot of people, and mm -hmm. the reason I say this is because today it's very obvious in hindsight that um, interest rates were going to go up a lot. But even a year ago, I remember tweeting being like, hey, I think interest rates are going to go up above 5%. And people are like, no, it's not going to get that high. Like a year ago, it was not clear that interest rates would get north of 5%. Today, it's like, you know, today they're above 5%. And it's yeah. unclear whether they've got north of 6%. And so um, I think that there are, a, like, I think a year ago, it was like what was what's very clear today was not clear a year ago. And so a year ago, when SVB was buying these shitty mortgages for with ten year maturities, they were buying basically. They were saying, "Okay, we're going to get take two percent interest for the next ten years." Well, today that looks terrible because you can get five percent interest for the next year, and you can get four percent interest for the next ten years. So today it looks obviously stupid. A year ago, it wasn't as obvious, and I know that because my wealth manager was making the same mistake. So, like, what could regulators have done? Um, good question. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. Like, they could be like, look, uh, I mean, one of the ways is, is to say we need to understand, uh, like, y y they almost have to run the bank and make sure that, hey, look, you have not taken too much risk. Right. If you spend a hundred billion dollars and buy, buy half year deposits in two percent securities, you're taking a ton of risk. And you don't, you're not hedging that risk with interest rate swaps or something. So I think they could have come in and said, hey, look, you're taking – like, you know, basically it's an audit of like what what are you buying to make sure – to see how much risk you have. Like what's the maturity and the credit profile of what you're buying? So if you're buying things with a, like a really long maturity, so let, let's uh, – that that's a lot of risk because the interest rates could go up or down. And right. so there's a lot of risk. And if you're buying something from somebody who's like an, a shittyish uh, borrower, there's a lot of risk there too, right? Because what – you know, you don't know if – Toys R Us is going to go do really well or go bankrupt. 
So, um, you know, you got to you got to look at the risk of the maturity and the risk of the un, uh, of the borrower. And so, the, you know, the Federal Reserve could you know literally do that at every single bank. But not if everyone's crying, we have too much regulation, we have too much regulation, we're killing American capitalism, then they can't do that because then they have to say, okay, this is a smaller bank, we shouldn't look at it. But the answer is, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think it's even more oversight, which is uh, something that nobody wants. Yeah, I was going to say, do you think it's going to get really, really regulated now or... I, I, look, look, the American taxpayer today is on the hook for a bunch of this money. I know that like right. the, the American taxpayer is not bailing out SVB, but the government stepped in and said, look, so uh, basically the value of a bunch of assets fell. Like, imagine if Bitcoin, uh, you bought Bitcoin at uh, $60,000, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, the government announced that, hey, look, today Bitcoin's only worth $25,000. But if you give it to us, if you, if, you want, if you want to borrow from us, the government, and you're a bank, we will loan you whatever you paid for it. So if you paid $60,000, we're going to give you $60,000 for one Bitcoin in collateral. Mm -hmm. You know, the government is now saying, hey, look, we're going to give you more money than your collateral is worth. And we know that. Right. That, that means the American taxpayer is paying for that. The American, you know what the government could do instead is say, hey, here's $60,000. Let, let me go buy debt or let me do something more productive. The mm -hmm. American government is now saying, hey, um, Nick, you bought $60,000. You bought Bitcoin in 2019 for $60,000. It's now worth $25,000. You're about to go bankrupt because you took out a, a bunch of, you borrowed a bunch of money to buy a bunch more Bitcoin. Give me your Bitcoin and I'll give you $60,000 for it. That's not fair. You know, that's not, the American taxpayer is bailing out big banks today. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. Uh, the question is, if, the question is whether it's a good thing or not is um, up in the air. Yeah. Um, but that is happening. Are there any other places outside of like taxes this budget could be taken? I mean, the war budget's even like two billion a day. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the American taxpayer is paying for the war oh, as well. Or like yeah, the American taxpayer true. paying for the, everything the federal government has for the SVB bailout. Uh, the Federal Reserve basically said, "Hey, we're gonna we're taxing all of the other banks. We uh, FDI insert in, FDIC insure a bunch of banks. They're gonna pay for the SVB bailout because oh, is that we, the trade for being FDIC insured? Yeah, yeah. It's Got basically it. you're you're you become your, the insurance it's company like a NATO for all network banks. for banks. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes." And so that's why they're like, hey, for the SVB bailout, that is not coming from the American taxpayer. And that's a great thing. For the, um, the other bank term, it's called bank term funding program that they set up, the Federal Reserve set up, that is absolutely coming from the American taxpayer. And it's the first time where I'm like, uh, I want to run for office. Like I'm thinking about uh, realistically running for uh, federal office because I'm like, I want to be a part of this. And this isn't like, you know, the American taxpayer keeps getting screwed in a way that they don't even understand. Right. And it's so fucked up. Um, and I've actually thought about it for the first time. You should. I'd love to. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. But um, anyway, that's what's going on at SVB. Um What's great is every, like, you know, everyone's able to make payroll. That's a fantastic thing. Um, these businesses that weren't really debtor, like, you know, creditors to banks are made whole. And that's a great thing. Right. The problem is this doesn't always happen with everybody else. And there's, uh, you know, uh, an unfair system in a lot of ways, but you know, we're mortal men. Uh, so I'm not sure how we fix these systems, but I think it's up to us to try and, uh, to try and do that because there's nobody else doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It seems You're like, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, you, what were you going to say? The CEO of the uh, of First Republic sold 3.6 million in shares on February 27th. 14 of his days own bank? Ago. Of, yeah, uh, of uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, of Silicon. Wow. The CEO of Silicon Valley Bank sold 3.6 million in shares of That's SVB definitely, on February 27th. Definitely not insider trading. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, isn't that a little sketchy? That's insanely sus. That's... that's so, I mean, why would you sell it other than like, you know, you hear in the industry, you hear in some group chat that you're in that like, you know, somebody else is about to be fucked. So, um, so there's like recently been this thing where uh, CEOs of businesses, like let's say you're the CEO of Apple. When can you sell Apple stock in a way that isn't insider trading? Right. So, because generally, you know, everything that's going to happen at the business, right? You're the fucking CEO of the business. If it's important, people have told you about it. So recently, there have been like, um, there's been a big question of like, you know, what CEOs used to be able to do is they'd say, okay, I've set up a plan where I sell, I'm going to sell a hundred shares of Apple stock the, 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 the final day of every month for the next year. 
Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, and it'll start in November of 2023. So you like, you know, I don't have any information that about what will happen in November, 2023. Certainly I don't have any information about what will happen, uh, you know, a year from now, like mm-hmm. things could change a lot. So I'm selling a hundred, I'm telling you the world, Hey, I'm selling a hundred shares the final day of every month, starting in November, 2020 or January 1st, 2024 for the next year. Right. And that seems like a fair way to do it. Cause basically yeah. there's, they're announcing their plan and they're like, this is it. What's recently been happening is a lot of CEOs are saying, I'm announcing a plan like that. Except I'm selling, like, you know, so so generally a, announcing a plan like that, it's called like this 10B51 or something like that. It's mm-hmm. basically says, this is how I, this is how I'm telling the world I'm not insider trading, but I'm selling some shares. I'm announcing a plan like this. Right. So recently what's been happening is a bunch of CEOs have been saying, okay, I'm announcing a plan. I'm selling uh, all of my shares next week. <laughs> and they're they're sort of saying, hey, look, this is still covered in the plan because I announced the plan and I'm right. set it up in the same structure that so technically this should be like a legal safe harbor. Yeah. And well, um, did you know that the the CEO sold eleven percent at the end of Feb? Uh their council sold almost twenty percent early Feb. Their CFO sold thirty two percent end of Feb, yeah. and their CMO sold a quarter at the beginning of Feb. This is all the, of their shareholders uh, of their this is uh, shares. SVB's Fuck. own executives. Jeez. Um, yeah, selling percentages of their stakes of equity. That's crazy. That is crazy. Um, there is this one case. Um, there's this one case that I, I, I just want to uh, chat about because I read about in the Wall Street Journal. There's this company called OnTrack. Okay, yeah. there's some pharmaceutical company, and they sign uh, they sign contracts with big pharmaceutical companies. So the CEO of this company, he know, he's like texting with his uh, coworkers and he's like, our relationship with Signia is a nightmare. Signia is going to cancel their contract pretty soon. Okay. Mm-hmm. And Signia is a massive part of OnTrack. He's the CEO of OnTrack and he's like, uh, we're going to lose our biggest client uh, in, uh, like, or, or, you know, very soon. Uh, so he's like, hey, I'm trying to sell some shares. Uh, I need to sell some uh, shares because he knows this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. So he goes to like you know um, a brokerage and he says, "Hey, I, I I need to sell my shares of this business." And they're like, "Look, you got to wait thirty days." He was trying to do that plan that I talked to you about a second ago. He's like, "I right. need I, I want to create a plan to sell some of my shares." And they're like, "You can't sell any shares for thirty days because you're just creating this plan and you don't you know you we don't, you can't trade on insider information." And he says, "Fuck you, I'm not working with you." So he goes to another brokerage and he says, "Hey, I need to sell some shares of mine," and so. He creates, uh, so they say, okay, let's sell some shares of yours. He, so he says, okay, I'm going to create a plan. It's August 13th. Okay. He creates the plan on August 13th, 2021. He sells, his first sale of shares is on August 17th, 2021. At, uh, okay. So oh four God. days four later, days. he starts selling shares, but he's like, look, I did it according to a plan. So I should be, technically it shouldn't be insider trading, even though it really is. Right. Uh, on August 19th, so two days after he starts selling shares, he announced that they announced that they're losing Signia as a customer and their share f- price falls 50%. He sells for about $22 a share. The shares end up at $11 a share. Wow. Um, and so he's like, hey, look, I, I share, I traded according to my plan, according to a plan. So I'm safe. This is, here's the plan. And the US government is like, no, you're insider trading. What happened um, to him? So this is in this is in court right now. Uh, he sold twenty four million dollars of on track sales in twenty twenty one under his ten b five one plan. Um, you know he sold twenty four million dollars, uh, and the stock declined from thirty two dollars when he started selling to under ten dollars. Stock trades are now under one dollar. Oh my god! So basically, he you know his twenty four million dollars would basically be worth like you know six hundred thousand dollars or something like that, or seven hundred thousand yeah. dollars, something like that. But um, you know he may go to jail. What happens in these cases to the money? It, it gets seized by the government. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I feel like it's a slap on the wrist, and you still get to keep it. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be my guess. Uh, I'm not sure what happens. But like, to the, uh, to the money. what was it? Well, I guess that was a Ponzi scheme. Like I was thinking, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, um, the government seized all his assets at the end. Yeah, I'm not sure they seized all of his assets. You know, there's this guy named Michael Milken who was involved in like insider trading, you know, before you were born, actually before I was born in like the 1980s. You learn about him in law school. Yeah. He, he, you know, he made billions of dollars. He got arrested and put in jail for two years. He got out. Turns out somehow he was still a billionaire. Uh, okay. And um, Donald Trump pardoned him right before he left office. That's how wow. rich this guy is. 
Uh, you can buy Donald Trump, basically. You can buy himself a pardon. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, that's, uh, I, you know, SVB, I'm glad that all the depositors were made whole. I feel like that's what what Same. needed to happen in order to keep yeah. the bank banking system alive. Um, I feel weird that taxpayers are on the hook, according to this bank term funding program. And by weird, I feel like it's really unfair. Uh, and I feel like there's a lot of like uh, other unfairness in the system that we probably don't have time to uh, touch on because uh, it's not really related to e-commerce. But I am curious to see what happens to all these loans that SVB gave out and how you have to repay them and what the terms look like after this. Did you hear about the second bank that fell to Signature Bank? I, I know I heard it, but I don't know anything about it. Yeah, me neither. I don't know much about it. One other thing I was thinking was like, I wonder how... So, you know, like we we're talking about this at probably a pretty, a much deeper level than I would say, you know, maybe the average person would. Like, how does this change the perception of privacy uh, and also like just new startups uh, or neobanks or some of these startup companies that are, you know, fintech companies? To the general public, like how does the average person who who isn't this deep in this world or reads this much and, and understands it, how does that change the perception of like fintech as an industry? Uh, good question. I don't know the answer to that. I do feel like, um, you know, it's sort of like okay. So what is the you know? Am I insured to two hundred fifty k or more than two hundred fifty k? Are these new banks? Are is there any risk in working with that? Like if it was Mercury Bank that fell. And right. I know Mercury Bank backs on the bank of somebody else, right? Like, Evolve um, Bank and Trust and then Evolve, uh, if, Choice Financial Group. If Evolve Bank and Trust fell, you know, would the government have stepped in? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, you know, that's a question that the like the owners of Evolve uh, are like not owed to they're owed by the federal government. Like if if are you going to insure just Silicon Valley Bank or us too? Like right. why are, if not us, why not us? Right. Um, and I feel like that's a question that's sort of been up in the air for a long time and no one's ever pushed the Federal Reserve to answer. But at this point, I think every, Americans and Evolve Federal uh, you know, Trust is owed that answer. Yeah. It'll be cool to see um, kind of the, the more positive repercussions of this whole incident and how it, it shapes the re – like you know, how it shapes rules or federal regulations or um, – just even like you know things like Mercury Vault coming out and being shipped, uh, yeah. what type of products come out of it? For sure. Um, okay, I think we've got to wrap up there. Our next podcast, I've got all this uh, gold about Allbirds. Um, I love Allbirds. Uh, I think it's a great brand. Uh, you know, I, I love the people that run Allbirds. It's had a very tumultuous uh, career as a public company. It started out with a four billion dollar valuation, and today it trades at under two hundred million dollars. And I want to get into like what has happened over the past two or three years as a publicly traded company, where a ton of information is available. Um, some quick highlights of that episode is first, Q4 2022 was the first time that they had a revenue decline between like for a year over year comparison. So Q4 2021 actually did more revenue than Q4 2022, which is pretty crazy. Like their sales yeah. went down. Wow. Um, and there's one other thing I want to mention. They hired a new CFO and um, I, I don't know anything about this person. And I don't think this has anything to do with anything other than I think it's interesting because they have to announce the salary that they give this person. Oh. And so I'm always curious what salaries look like for positions like this at publicly yeah. traded companies. You know, to be clear, I don't know, and I, I barely know anybody working at Allbirds, and um, I certainly don't know who the CFO is. But I did want to provide this a little bit of feedback here. So they just hired a new person. They announced it March eighth, so five days ago. Um, they hired a uh, the new CFO. The person that's the new CFO. Her name is Annie Mitchell. She was previously the VP of Finance at Jim Shark, and before that, she was at Adidas for ten years. Wow. You want to guess what her salary is? Um, I'm going to guess, um, like a uh, half a million in cash and that equivalent in stock. Uh, not, uh, not crazy off. Um, 375 K base salary up to a 40% bonus of that 375 K. Wow. And then every year, like uh, $1 million in option grants that vest over four years, so 250 k a year in options and 250 k a year in RSUs. Wow. Um, and so I, I'm only bringing this up not because I know anything about her or because I think it's high or low. Actually, I think it's a pretty reasonable package yeah, for a public currency CFO. But 
uh, in case you're hiring a CFO for your business and presumably you're not hiring a publicly traded, you're not presumably uh, listening to this and you're publicly traded, 375K base salary for a public a publicly traded company CFO, 40% bonus, 1 million in options over four years, 1 million in RSUs over four years. Wow. Um, okay, I'm really excited to get into this because I love Same. Allbirds and I think it's great. But I, th- uh, you know, I, I think we got a lot of detail that came out, and so I'm excited to dig into this with you. Awesome. Same. This was a fun episode. I feel like this I learned was everything episode. about Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, you should. Uh, this article by Mark Rubenstein. I linked it to you right here, Nick. It's on yeah, netinterest.co. I, it I don't even know what that is. You should take a look at that. It's pretty short. You probably read it in ten minutes. Sweet. That guy is 400 times smarter and 400 times more articulate than me. You should read it if you get a chance. Awesome. I will. Awesome. Appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next time to cut through the noise in CPG, retail, and e-commerce. And if you enjoyed this episode, then why not share it with a friend? And be sure to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to your podcasts on.